Welcome to Mastery Us, the online global community for motivated creatives providing personal, meaningful, and interactive connections. Pursue your artistic dreams while getting personal feedback from world-class masters and building authentic relationships with artists just like you. It's a way of connection with creativity being our foundation, but it's, it's as if we're uplifting one another. Each group follows similar monthly rhythms, but is unique like each artist in them. Find the perfect one for you. But, oh, I would definitely say just jump in with both feet and just have fun. You just never know. It's just fantastic. I love it. It's a relationship and getting yes. to know the artist and yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's mentorship and, and friendship. You'll begin each session with your master in warm connection. Your navigator will introduce any new members and you'll spend a few minutes celebrating the achievements of your fellow members. There's nothing like it. The support that you get, the inspiration, the motivation, you know, the cheering in the background. The first half of each session is spent reviewing the homework your master artist assigned at the end of your last session. The second half of each session is teaching curated for you. We get to know you. As your navigator uses the info you provided in your new member profile form, the group discussions, and the questions you ask, they ensure your session is specially designed for you and your group. At the end of each session, your master will give you an assignment to work on until you meet again. But it doesn't end there. Between your session, your navigator will support and guide you as you connect with your group, engaging online, in our regular live events, or in your mid-month sessions. I, I enjoy getting together at my mid-month meetings with my group and asking questions and sharing our celebrations and also sh sharing our failures and being able to laugh about it. We're excited to have you with Masterius, rediscover the joy in being creative. Hello everyone, welcome to Masterius. I'm Julie DeBoer, your host. If you're a member, welcome back and thanks for using your free ticket to be here. One of the perks of membership. If you're new, we're so glad to have you. Mentorship has been a turning point for so many of us in our creative journeys. If you'd like to chat more about Masterius movement, because we're making mentorship with master artists accessible and affordable from the comfort of your studio in trusted community, stay on after the event and I'll answer any questions and share more about it. I'll also give away a one month recording library membership to a non-member who sticks around after the event. I'll also give away a Mastery's painting apron at the very end of our interview to one lucky attendee. So stick around for that too. Everyone, don't forget to say hello in the chat. Share your comments and questions. You can private message them to me or share them for everyone to see. And you probably wanna grab a pen and paper, trust me. You'll probably be taking notes. We're thrilled to have the highly acclaimed artist and Masterius mentor, Mark Eanes, on this episode of The Artist Diaries. Before we delve into some real talk about the art business and his career, let me share a bit of background on Mark. Mark Eanes is a versatile abstract artist based in Richmond, Virginia, with a background in painting, printmaking, photography, curation, and education. He previously resided in California's Bay Area, where he served as a professor emeritus at California College of Arts. Mark has taught at several universities around the state for over 33 years and has conducted workshops globally, including online courses through the phenomenal Mark Eanes Academy. Mark exhibits widely around the world and is the recipient of numerous awards. He is a passionate artist, always experimenting and finding new ways to interpret the world around him. Welcome, Mark. Thank you very much, Julie. I appreciate that. Absolutely. And again, I'm Julie DeBoer, your host. I am one of the founders of Mastrius. I'm also an artist. I work in acrylic. My work is very uh, flowing and lyrical. It comes out of 
um, a childhood of music and dance and song that I didn't really get to pursue and it found its way out of me in my work, which was really exciting to discover not long ago. Again, I'm going to stick around after the event to share a bit more about Masterius, about how to work with a mentor, how to choose a mentor, and all the other stuff that we're up to here uh, in this awesome community. And again, I'll give away that painting apron at the end of the event. So stick around till the end and then a one month recording library uh, membership as well to one lucky non-member. All right, well, that was quick and easy, Mark. I've been looking forward to this uh, since we booked you, basically. Um, we have met before, obviously. I get to meet with all of our mentors before they join our team. I also got to meet with your wife, which was wonderful. And um, I'm excited to dive in a bit more, uh, you know, talking about exactly what you want to talk about, about your career and some of the highlights. And folks, again, don't forget to use that chat. Uh, and if you have questions or comments, I'll try to get to them all. Thank you, Julie. Where sh how should we start? By the way, thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, introducing me to Masterist and inviting me as one of the mentors. Um, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this. So thank you again. Mm -hmm, absolutely. We were so happy to bring you on the team, Mark. Um, yeah, let's dive in. So. Um, how about you give us a little bit of a synopsis of your career as an artist? Um, a little bit, I, I mean, it always usually starts somewhere in our childhood and, and yeah. then bloss blossoms as we grow. Um, and I know that you have a PowerPoint, which I'm excited to see as well. And we can dive into that anytime that you would like. Okay, okay. I um, let's do it this way. I think if you don't mind, I think I will go to the PowerPoint here in just a second because it does cover an overview of, of my work and my career going back to right out of high school. But Sweet. I will preface with a few remarks. Yeah, um, that sounds fantastic. One of the reasons that I prepared this PowerPoint, I hadn't thought to do so prior, but in my conversation with Anna a couple of days ago, she asked me a very interesting and pointed question as I remarked to you earlier, and that was the following. She said, I see that in your teaching and in your career and your work, you emphasize the importance of drawing and particularly from drawing from observation. And yet, she remarked, your work is very abstract. And mm -hmm. she was curious about that connection or disconnection as it were and how and why does the drawing inform the abstract paintings? Um, and so I, I gave that a lot of thought after we had that conversation. And I figured the best way to illustrate this is with images and a little bit of um, comment behind it. But because I'm covering 53 years of work, as I promised you earlier, I'm gonna be very succinct uh, do my best to keep this at a reasonable time, around 10 minutes or so. But mm -hmm. I think it will be really helpful for the rest of our conversation and for your audience, whether they have questions or, or what have you. So if you don't mind, maybe I'll just dive into this. Absolutely. Yeah, please we'll do. Okay. So I'll share my screen. And we'll go here and you can tell me how it's going. Yeah, we can see it. All right, I'm going to make this larger. Perfect. And then I need to minimize our thing so I can see it okay and move that down. Is that okay? Can you see it okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks good. So right, 53 years, an overview in just several slides. <laughs> <laughs> quite, quite a task. Obviously, yeah. there's a lot of work that will be missing, but I think I've got enough to really give an overview. So let's begin. Mm -hmm. I've got here 19. And can you see this cursor if I use it? Yes, yeah, I can see it. Great. So 1970, uh, Julie, uh, right out of high school, I moved from Virginia to California and began studying art at the age of 18. Mm -hmm. I'm very fortunate. I had very good teachers who gave me a very rigorous, uh, even a formal, traditional, somewhat academic training in both drawing and painting. This image here is the only surviving image of my time at UC Santa Barbara where one of my mentors, Irma Cavett, had us do numerous uh, studies of the master painters. In this case, it was Sicily. Mm -hmm. So I really had a very rigorous training to work uh, both from observation as well as studying the masters. These still lives, these beats 
the callow lilies in this one here, was the work I did after uh, my time at the college. And of all the masters I studied at that time back at UC Santa Barbara, I think Cezanne was one of my uh, favorites. And this still life here of the fruits sort of harkens to some of the things I was thinking about. I should also mention this, that when I was graduated out of college in 1974, Julie, two years later, I went to Europe and I spent four and a half months on a Eurail pass. And my, uh, my, the purpose of the trip, other than just having fun in Europe in 1976, was <laughs> my itinerary was to go to all, as many great museums as I could and see as much art as I could that I had been seeing in slides and books. I really wanted to go to the source. And when I came back from that trip in Europe in 1976, it literally changed my life. Mm -hmm. I was completely um, committed to being and dedicating my life to being an artist. Mm -hmm. The drawings on the right wall quickly was a study of Kathy Colbitz. And of course, I enjoy drawing from natural forms, uh, botanical forms, and so on. So those were all done right during and right after college. Okay. Next, this is going to be very different now. So... Again, the formative years were 1970 to 84. I was working constantly as a figurative artist. And then in 1984, I went to Mills College in Oakland, California to do graduate work. And I had just started toying around, uh, Julie, with the idea of working abstractly, but nothing really serious. But when I got there, I had three years of graduate work and I was able to really explore new territory. Now, a lot of work happened there during those three years, but I chose these images for a particular reason. When I was in Paris in 76, I had the good fortune to visit the Brancusi um, uh, studio in Paris. Uh, Constantine Brancusi was um, an artist, a sculptor, uh, Romanian, and I absolutely fell in love with the, his work, the simplicity of it, the illusion and the, the reference to the human form, but there was such a purity about these shapes that they just struck me. Now, to be clear, I had other influences as well, but I'm showing how influences can make a difference in, in an artist's work. So sure. I did many of these large charcoal drawings and I'm standing there as, just to see the scale of, of these drawings. And I did numerous uh, of those drawings, as you can see here. And then they culminated in this very large drawing here, Julie, which is about twice the size of this one here. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I was doing sculpture as well. And these are ceramic forms that are quite large. They're about life size, about five to six feet tall with these sort of balanced uh, forms and shapes. So that was my graduate work at Mills. Now, even though I was working abstractly, I still continue to draw from the figure and from master studies, which which I've done all my life, including up to now. Mm. I'm including just a few of these, and I'll explain briefly. When I do a master's study, and I, when I teach at college, I have my students work this way also and from paintings. I'm not interested in copying for copying's sake. I need to make that quite clear. Yeah. What I'm interested in, and I've noted it there in the notes, is the structural abstraction or the design and composition of these remarkable works of art that I'm mm. looking at. Mm -hmm. This piece here is actually a very small etching by Rembrandt in the Louvre Museum in Paris. I saw it as a young man, and it was quite small. I'm going to guess maybe five by seven inches or so. But I was struck by the operatic nature of this remarkable image of, of Christ before the ill. And so I decided to go back home after that and make large-scale charcoal drawings. So all of these, with the exception of I think this one here, are quite large, Julie. Uh, this one measures maybe three by four feet, three by five feet, and many of them are four by five feet. So they're, they're quite large. And during that time, and you can see even here on the right, I'm beginning to abstract the figures because to make that point again, I was interested in the design and the abstract quality of these remarkable uh, images. Mm -hmm. Well, as it turned out, these culminated in a very large drawing that I did, the Raft of the Medusa, um, and I was invited to have a one-person show in Paris in 2007. So wow. there I am with my nephew, Ryan, and my niece, Leah. He was 13 mm -hmm. at the time. I think she was about 10 or 11. Now they're both grown with careers. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the very large drawing that I did, the, the Raptor of the Medusa. 
Um, and I had gone to Paris to see this remarkable painting and was so struck by it, I decided to do a very large scale drawing. It took me the better part of three months uh, mm -hmm. to work on this. So Jericho, the French painter, was the, was the painter who did this. Very quickly, the interesting story on this is that this is during a time where Paris had been sending uh, ships down to Africa to, to gather slaves. Uh, so they were uh, in the slave trade at that time. And there was a true story where this ship sank and there were survivors on this very large raft. Mm -hmm. Only a few survived. And what's interesting is that Jericho chose to have a black man on the top of this pyramid. You see, it really forms a pyramid, if you will, yeah. these characters. And he has the black man as the hero of the story because right here in the distance is a little ship that saved them. Oh, and yeah. it's, him, it's him waving the flag that makes him the hero, if you will, mm -hmm. of the story. And so Jericho's uh, message to, to Paris and to France was that the entire country was adrift because mm -hmm. of their stance towards slavery. Mm -hmm. So not only was I interested in this remarkable painting, but the story behind it. Yeah, no kidding, beautiful. Now, I wanted to talk and address uh, Anna's question about abstraction, which we could spend the whole rest of the hour talking about, but again, <laughs> I'll be brief. <laughs> uh, this is a little painting down here uh, by Corot. I just saw this painting recently, by the way, at the National Gallery here in Washington, D.C. It's rather small. I'm going to guess it to be, oh, I don't know, maybe uh, 9 by 11 inches, 11 by 14. Quite small, but look how beautiful this little painting is. Yeah. Well, I wanted to make a point about abstraction. So what I did was I cut out a little detail and turned it upside down. Oh, yes. That's what we have here. Now, if you hadn't seen this and put your hand over this painting here and just look at this painting here for a moment, one would say, well, that's quite abstract. Mm -hmm. yep. the, re the reason it's abstract is because we don't have a reference of reality, mm -hmm. which is quite frankly one of the big aspects and nature of abstraction. We don't quite understand what we're looking at. Not that it even matters, but basically to make a long lecture quite short, <laughs> The composition is an arrangement. So what's he arranging here? He's arranging shapes and color and rhythm and texture and pattern and value and a few other things. And that's what keeps the eye moving throughout this beautiful design and composition. Similarly here. Um, to the far right, and so these are influences, just a few of many that I've had over the years, over the five decades. And so this is a very brief talk about the nature of abstraction. I've also looked at Paul Clay right here, the Swiss artist, because I love what he's doing when it comes to spatial play, Julie, but the light, that sense of light play. Keep mm -hmm. in mind, we're only looking at a slide, not the actual painting, which makes a big difference. But you can see how beautiful that is. Again, it's just the arrangement of some shapes with color and value that creates that. Yeah. And then finally, Richard Diemenkorn is a California painter who died several years ago, who was a big influence on my work as well. He was a figurative painter who then moved into abstraction. I chose these two because you can clearly see the relationship to landscape with this one and this one. But mm -hmm. you can also see how he is moving towards abstraction by the flattening of the shapes and by the lack of detail, et cetera, et cetera. So then I... Moving from there, these are some examples of my work. Uh, these are acrylic and collage media. Uh, these are mixed media, acrylic and ephemera um, on wooden panels. And they're pretty large. This one and this one and this one, Julie, are four by four feet. So they're pretty mm -hmm. good size. And this one's even bigger. It's about six by six feet. So they're pretty good size. Um, the, I want to say that I'm going to show you some photographs here in a second. What I attempt to do is to take all these lessons from the masters and find my own path. And I will say this. It took me, frankly, many years to get out from underneath the shadow of those giant masters. <laughs> that's, a quote from, that's a quote from Matisse, the painter. He said that the artist must pit his or her personality against the great masters. Uh, in order to find their own vision, their own voice, their own path. This painting here on the right is sort of a, um, a nod to Paul Clay, who I just talked about earlier. And this is where I kind of want to go in my work in the future, Julie, because I like 
the idea of playing with color as light. And you can hopefully see that attempt in this piece. Um, finally, I need to talk about the other influence, which is a great influence with me, and that is my photography. And I've been doing this for many, many years. Um, so I've got here in the title, the role of photography to look and to see. Uh, these particular images were taken in um, Naples, uh, Italy, uh, but I've traveled in, to many, many places and I'm drawn to old walls, doors, portals, windows. Uh, there is no people in most of my pictures. I'm more interested in the time and the wear and the wear and tear of these beautiful walls and surfaces, the history of them, the stories they could tell. And in my own work, I do a lot of adding and subtracting to get to these rich surfaces. So I see these as sort of a counterpoint or an allusion to the photographs. Yeah. So that is, uh, I'll stop sharing and hopefully I kept that pretty brief. Yeah, I know that's fascinating. It's, it's always a wonder for um, an artist to look at a master who, who works abstractly knowing the history of, of, you know, art school and drawing and, uh, you know, learning the skills and the elements of design and then to see the abstract work at, at the, you know, after a few decades in a career to try to understand all the thought and work and practice that went into that design that, that, that can be, you know, some people that maybe aren't um, you know, that that into art or collecting art, uh, they might simplify it. But then when an artist sees it, it's just like, oh, my gosh, there's there's decades underneath this paint. Uh, so that's that's fascinating. Thank you for sharing that visual story. That's really, really helpful. Good, I'm glad. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and and folks, uh, again, put, pop your questions in the chat if you have any as as we go. So, yeah, when so I I I love seeing that visual as you are now working in abstract uh, and you're teaching uh, extensively as well. What is your focus in in your teaching with your students? Good question. Um, so very quick backstory, if I can, to answer that, Julie. Um, so I taught at various colleges and institutes in and around the Bay Area near San Francisco for the last 33 years, um, some state colleges, junior colleges. Um, but the college I was with the most was California College of the Arts in San Francisco. Um, and I taught primarily drawing and painting courses everything from anatomy, because I love drawing the figure, which I didn't include too much of. So everything from anatomy to uh, color and design and basic painting from observation for, for the students there. Now, I give you that backstory because when COVID hit in 2021, it changed everything for me and Maria. Um, I had about six weeks left in the semester, Julie, in the spring, and had to learn to um, teach online like that. I mean, literally the next week, imagine. Wow. And I'm the kind of teacher who does a lot of demonstrations and lectures and so on. Um, and imagine, I've been with my students all that. So we, we pivoted very quickly. And Maria and I went out and got some equipment uh, because we had to videotape my lectures and demonstrations so I could get through the semester, which I did. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> And it was a kind of it was kind of brilliant in a way because I'm not a technical person, but my wife Maria, thank God, she is, and yeah. so we got through it, you know, and it was okay, and the students did the work, and people seemed to be okay with it. Well, I'm telling you the story because it's going to answer your question, so forgive me for the song, longer answer. Um, yeah. So right after that chapter, I had a year uh, break from school. I had been awarded a sabbatical for a whole year. Oh, fantastic. It was fantastic. So I dodged having to teach uh, remotely for a whole year. Okay. <laughs> what we decided to do was instead create some online courses. Um, the first one was the language of color. And then we did the language of design. And then more recently, the language of drawing. I'm giving you this history because it's important. I wanted to create an online course, Julie, that was the equivalent of an entire uh, semester curriculum 
yeah. at my college for a fraction of the cost. I really yeah. wanted to get it out there and available to artists who could not afford a college education. Mm -hmm. And that was really a premise to do that and to create a community of artists that would enjoy that. Yeah. And that's what we were able to do. And it was really COVID and all of that that allowed us to do that. We made really delicious lemonade out of those lemons. <laughs> now, that's the backstory. This May, I retired from teaching at the colleges for good. And we have moved, as you noted, from California to Virginia only recently, maybe yeah. two months ago. So it's been a hurricane, a Herculean a uh, series of events that has really taken up so much of our time and energy just to land in a beautiful home here in Richmond, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Starting next week, my outbuilding on the property will be uh, upgraded with some con contractors to make it a beautiful studio. In the meantime, I'm in there uh, when I can be doing botanical drawings and studies just because I need to do something. Yeah. Um, so to answer your question, we're going to continue to create these online courses, but we're going to take a break for a year. And we used to teach um, seven artists in our own studio in person before COVID. And we love that mm -hmm. because people came, they worked with us for three or four days on these uh, color and design workshops. And then they would come back for future engagements and critiques and so on. And we created some wonderful friends during that and a, and a community in the Bay Area. We're hoping to do that here as well. Mm -hmm. This is answering your question now. So I, I really looking forward to being able to teach uh, small groups here again. I'll probably contact the college here uh, in Richmond to see if I get a, an occasional position as a visiting professor and what have you. But uh, mostly to be quite honest, I'm looking forward to just doing my work right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, considering all that you have, oh, the whirlwind of the last few years, not to mention moving uh, from yeah. California to Virginia, you know, huge and a new studio, which is very exciting, but again, huge uh, turmoil in your in your art uh, career for the last few years. So yes. I appreciate that. Um, one thing that um, you know, teaching people to see abstractly is something that uh, comes up when I think of Mark Eanes. Can you delve into what that means for someone who's never worked abstractly, but is very interested in it? Sure. Um, I'll do this by giving you some, a couple of anecdotal um, incidences in my teaching at the college and how I'm preparing the students whether they decide to work uh, figuratively from observation or whether they decide to eventually move into abstraction. One of the, one of the, one of the first, well, first of all, let me do this. I'll make a note. Here is a glass of water. You can see it's a glass of water. Uh, if I bring it in really close mm. to the camera, you don't really know what you're looking at. Right. And if you were to take a photograph or make a painting of that, Chances are a lot of people wouldn't really recognize what it is. It's a series of shapes and colors. Mm -hmm. That in a nutshell is the beginning of abstraction. Okay. You can also go far enough away from something to do the same thing. So it's micro and macro. So we'll start with that idea. Okay. The second thing that's really, really important, I think, for any artist who is wanting to consider either moving into abstraction or continuing to work if they are working abstractly, is to familiarize themselves with art history. Mm. And to familiarize themselves and maybe even align themselves with certain artists whose work they admire, respect, and are very interested in. Mm -hmm. And if they do that, as I've done, they'll find that these artists just didn't wake up one day and decide, you know, today I think I'll just be an abstract artist. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Now it does for some because it just does. But by and large, it's a journey. Mm -hmm. And by by studying and looking at their journey and seeing how they went from, let's say, painting up landscapes and how they would like maunder on these trees that kept getting broken up and broken up. And finally, the next thing you know, he, he's in pure abstraction. That can help because they can begin to see, oh, so that's the thread. And that's the journey that took them to here from here. So that's 
also useful. Now, my first assignment oftentimes, Julie, in my painting class back at CCA is I would take about four or five very large brown paper bags and I would just crumple them a little bit and mm -hmm. put them on a model stand and I would light them. Mm. So they're very animated when that happens. These bags become very sort of animated. And I would demonstrate to the students how to begin a painting through the drawings. And my advice to them was, do not think you are drawing or painting a paper bag. Get that out of your head. Just get it out of your head. Because the moment you start to think that, oh, this is a very difficult crumpled bag I'm painting, you will fail or you will struggle. Yeah. However, if you just look, and I show them how to do this step by step, if you just look at these interesting shapes that are happening, you ignore the little details and you break down these big facets and planes and get those in place, the journey has begun to make this drawing or painting of a paper bag. Mm -hmm. I also make the distinction, I think a rather important one, there's a big difference, I think, between just representing something and interpreting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like big that. Big difference. And a lot of people get hung up on representation and they don't allow themselves the fun or the freedom to interpret. And so I allow the students to do that. And some of them actually move into some abstraction as well. It just happens. I've done the same thing with drapery, for instance, which is another beautiful form. You light drapery and you, and again, you're not drawing drapery, everybody. You're not painting it. You're looking at shapes, and pattern, and rhythms, and value, and all these formal issues. So that's an avenue, if you will. I've even taken really large, um, really large butcher paper, Julie White, and just crumpled it up and put it on the wall. Nice. Fun stuff like that. You know, th this allows people to move into an inner place for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, the final thing I want to say here, because there's much to be said about this, is someone once said, I forget who, that if you scratch an abstract painting just below it, there's a landscape. Ah. <laughs> and not necessarily a, a literal landscape, but most certainly a landscape of the mind. Mm. That to me is very intriguing. Yeah. I love so I that. Think it a little bit. Yeah. Um, what you said really resonates. And I know who's here in the audience, uh, so many of our members, um, we, we understand getting hung up on the representational subject, right? Yes. Uh, and and it is, it's a feat to let go of that and to dig into the shapes and the patterns and the value and really simplify things down to the elements, which is what I'm hearing you're saying is, is part of that getting into abstract. So that's really exciting because I didn't, I didn't make that connection. Um, and is it true, have you seen um, in your years of teaching and working with artists, this progression of artists normally when they get started they want very much to paint representationally. They want it to look like the thing they're painting. It's, if it's a landscape, they want it to look right. Um, and yes. then once, once they figure out how to do that well, then yes. they spend years and decades trying to stop and letting go and interpreting instead of representing in their work. Do you see that trend as well? I think that trend is a, a fairly natural trend to happen if someone is dedicated enough to stay at it for a very long time. Um, most certainly, um, you know, your own work is quite abstract to my eyes. You know, you really are these beautiful rhythms that you create. And yes, we recognize your images, but it's it's much, much more than that, as are a lot of artists. Um, what I try to help artists understand, Julie, is if they, well, where to start? If they're just starting out and they want to work from observation, uh, I, I do my best to explain that's a bit of a journey and one must be patient. Uh, and and so that's that's why I created the language of drawing and design to help people understand that and there's these you know the, I don't know who said this there was an author a while back who said something about the ten thousand hours to create have you know about the ten so the premise is that ten thousand hours of intense activity is just the beginning to get a handle on what it is you're doing whether you're playing the violin basketball or in this case drawing and painting. I did the math once with my students on this, by the way. It's roughly about five years of a 40-hour week, five or oh, six. Okay. So that's just the beginning, if you think about it. Yeah. So once they put in all those hours, they're going to get somewhere. Yeah. 
And the two main, I think the two main ingredients is desire, mm. which will always sustain us in our efforts, and a sense of stick to itness. Mm. You know? mm -hmm. The stick to itness, the perseverance, you know, in, in light of all the difficulties that one encounters. So to get back to your question, I do think, now, I think it goes both ways. Some people go into figurative work, they love it so much, the work just takes them somewhere after a while. And I, I like that phrase that sometimes we take the work somewhere, but sometimes it takes us somewhere. That's right. And you know what I'm talking about. All the artists out there know what I'm talking about. We take it for a while and then it takes us. I think some people just stick with figurative work the whole time. Some are people are realists, mm -hmm. some are photorealists, some are expressionists. The gamut of expression is as wide as there are human experiences. I believe mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. and it's rightly so. Yeah. Others move from the figurative work, regardless of the subject matter, and inevitably it starts to take them into an area that one might call non-representational or abstraction, which is a tricky term, quite frankly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I hope that answered your question. I hope it did. Yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> okay. Um, there are a few questions that have come up, and okay. uh, you had mentioned threads before, and Gwen Day actually had a, had a good question here. Uh, she loves your story and slideshow. Is there a thread or a message you are wanting to state in your recent works? I need a moment. Yes. That's, that's a big question. <laughs> it is a big question. Finding threads. Yeah. I'm interested, first of all, in the challenge of making a painting that works. I'm mm -hmm. really interested in that challenge. Um, I could, uh, let me back it up. Underneath those paintings that you saw, there are many other paintings that came before that got painted over, scraped away, so on and so forth. So I, I struggle with the work. Okay. And a lot of times uh, the work ends up in the middle phase uh, being what I call the ugly phase, where it's just, it's not good. Mm -hmm. and I, I, I'm someone who's patient and I persevere. So my goal, this is not a thread yet, which I'll get to, but my goal is to persevere and to be patient and to get through everything I need to get through in a given painting, whether it takes me weeks or months, and finally be able to step back and go, okay, that's it. It's done. Mm -hmm. Nothing more to say. Because I love the harmony. I love the balance. I love the equilibrium that's happening, that every little move that I could have made down to the tiniest line is done. You know, yeah. That is a remarkable feeling because it means that you've gotten into the ring, you've, you've done your fight, so to speak, and you've and you've come out victorious. Yeah. You know, you've won that battle, so to speak. But it's glorious because I always have fun doing it. You know, yeah. I always have fun doing it. Now the thread, you see a lot of my paintings are architectural in a way as well. Mm -hmm. And and I'm interested in the structure and the building of these of these images. And the dynamic between organic and architectural fascinates me. And I mm. try to get those two to marry each other as well I can, you know, even this piece behind me does that. So that fascinates me because it's really hard to pull that off, at least the way I like to work. Mm. So I think the thread is equilibrium, harmony, hopefully beauty. Um, and, um, and a, and a sense of, of wonder and mystery, because this is all very mysterious stuff, after all. Absolutely. It's, it's even difficult, as you know, to put words to it sometimes, but it's a very mysterious act. And I remember watching recently a video on Sean Scully, who is a painter out of New York, who I admire quite a bit, and he's an abstract painter. And in this video, it's interesting, he's sitting in his chair looking at some work across the room, Julie, and he's just looking at it like this, studying it while the guy is interviewing him. And... He turns to him, he says, you know, I'm listening to you. I'm not ignoring you, but I'm really looking at this painting here at the moment. And I'm asking myself, because it's not done yet, why this and not that? Mm. And I thought to myself, that is such a great statement. 
I even had a show recently. It was a pretty big show, a lot of work, and I that was the title. Why this and not that? Mm. Right? Yeah. You understand. All the artists understand. You're making decisions. You're solving problems. You're trying to figure out what your next move is. You make a move, it works. You make a move, it doesn't work. And then on and on and on. And so why this and not that? And that point where it just all comes together and settles down and says, and the painting says, I have nothing more to say to you. Yeah. And you have nothing more to say to me. Let's just take a walk. <laughs> Oh, I love that. I just, you know, just this week in our email uh, that I write to our members, we I talked about how do you know when a painting is done, and and you've touched on that magical moment when you've you've captured everything it needs to say. Uh, you also talked about what I would call problem solving. That each piece is to like you're tackling it. Uh, you're trying to figure it out um, and understand what what elements it needs and what it's saying, uh, which I imagine is much more complex and complicated with abstract work. Do you find that to be true? Yes and no. Uh, I think it would be true for many people, but having such a background in, in, in uh, figurative work, all the, the formal elements, it's kind of much all the same thing. It's really about balancing out the the composition the design with all these elements color shape and so on um but i love you touched on this uh sixty four thousand dollar question when is it done which <laughs> yeah. i love that subject i have long conversations with my students about it because it's really compelling uh, yeah. very quickly if i may um one of my favorite answers to that and i don't know who it was said uh, a good pa a, a painting perhaps is never truly finished hopefully it stops at a very good place um, mm. I know that to be true because I've, I've made paintings, excuse me, uh, exhibited them, put them back in my racks, and then a year or two later brought them back out and said, no, nah, it's not there yet, you know? <laughs> um, so it didn't stop at a good place, you see. It, it, it did at the time, but with the passing of time, I became more critical in my work and what it is I wanted to accomplish. And I think that's what I want to say about when is a painting finished. I think the answer is, Time is the great bear is the great barometer. We have to give our work time. We have to look at it, live with it, put it away, pull it back out, and and that you know what you fall in love with today or next week, maybe a month or two or a year passes, and you look at it again, and you're not as in love with it as you were when you thought you finished it. Right. Which yeah. is a very compelling subject to me. Yeah. You know. Fabulous. I, I love that um, in abstract work, all the elements remain the same. All the principles that we learn and practice um, are mm -hmm. consistent. There's these foundational uh, concepts that uh, I always say it's best to learn the rules so that you can learn how to break them well if you're going to break them. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, there's a great, great question too from Lynn. Um, in your early abstracts, your palette was quite muted. It seems your photography, as you've shown us this evening, um, your palette is very similar. Is there a reason for this, I guess, between your early abstracts and photography? Yes. Um, the short answer to that, uh, Julian, who am I addressing this to, by the way? Lynn. Hi, Lynn. Uh, that's a great question. The shorter answer to that, Lynn, is um, during COVID, um, myself and Maria, like so many others, were kind of basically under house arrest. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we didn't go anywhere. We didn't meet anybody. And, you know, we were in home a long, long time. And um, with that, there was an opportunity for depression. And, mm -hmm. and, like so many others of us human beings who were in lockdown. This is a tough chapter for all of us. And so I really got into the studio and I worked a lot and I decided to get, um, I just started to use color as a means to avoid that state of mind. Okay. And I can tell you for a fact that during the last few years, I have embraced color with more verve and more, um sort of daring that i was before the muted the more muted palettes okay. and then the moment i started doing these courses on the language of color for instance 
I that opened up my eyes to what's possible because I did a lot of research for that particular course. And um, in doing so, I did a lot of exercise, color exercises, just so I knew what I'm talking about even further. And then I realized, oh my goodness, this is a lifetime of learning. I, I've been painting, at that time, I'd been painting for over 40 some years and thought I knew a fair amount about color. But then I also realized, Julie, that there was so much more to investigate and, and, and become a little more daring. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's really the answer to that question. Okay, uh, it highlights that you are still on a journey and that is always reassuring for the rest of us to hear. Uh, there is no arriving. This is meant to be a journey that doesn't really end. I love Amen. that. Amen to that. Mm. So in your 50 plus years of creating, this might be a hard question, was there a really pivotal moment that happened that changed your mind or changed your course or um, opened your mind in a way that was shocking and surprising mm. that, that you could share with us? Um, there, is a, there is an answer that came directly to my head. I wanna make sure it's the one I wanna use. <laughs> <laughs> it probably it is, if it's the first one. <laughs> it, it is, it, it was a powerful moment in my development, I think, for, for an important reason. Mm -hmm. So I'll just tell you the story then. Um, so the date is about 1980. So I graduated from ma uh, my master's degree in 87, Julie, and then I went on my own to live in Oakland and to work there. And um, shortly after my graduation, I was fortunate enough to get into one of San Francisco's better galleries um, early on, right out of uh, graduate school. And um, Michael Duneb was the my dealer, and who I'm still uh, friends with, by the way. Uh, he's in Spain now. Anyway, uh, I'd had a couple of shows with Michael, both solo and group shows. And I've been doing pretty well by him, and he was doing pretty well by me. And the, the paintings were selling, and I was feeling pretty heady and so on. And, you know, I felt like, hey, this is great, you know. And um, then one day I'm in my studio, Julie, and I'm working on a painting. I'm halfway through, I suppose. And a little voice came into my head. And the voice said, I wonder, and here I am painting, right? I wonder if Michael will like this painting as much as the ones that have been selling. Oh, yes. Now, this is a huge subject. Mm. I'm going to diverge just a second to mention to our audience that there's a book called The Gift by mm. Lewis Hyde that I highly recommend, The Gift, Lewis Hyde. And he talks about the importance of gifts, what they are, and that our artwork, our ability to make artwork is a gift. Mm -hmm. And the gift has to keep moving. So I won't go down that rabbit hole too much, but it talks about the authenticity of what we do and how the marketplace can corrupt that. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. So back to my studio. So I'm there frozen with a brush in my hand, realizing I was horrified by that thought. <laughs> horrified. Yep. horrified. And I stopped and I put the brush down. And honestly, I didn't paint for a while. I was I was that disturbed by asking myself who I was painting for. Mm -hmm. And the lesson there for me was that I had to remain sincere and authentic, even if it meant shifting the direction and the course of my work, you see, because the gallery was used to one thing. And if I go to a different direction and it's not as successful, then woe is me. You know, maybe the audience isn't there for that. This is not an unusual a phenomena or, or a, a challenge for artists. And um, I think it's a really um, dangerous place. It really brings up the question of sincerity and authenticity and why we do what we do. Yeah. You know, and uh, especially if we're making money, pretty good money at it, or, you know, that's, that's compelling. So I think that that anecdote that moment julie really came into my mind when you asked about a pivotal uh, kind of a light bulb moment for me in my work it was was that and ever since that moment um i've tried to be true to myself even just recently i had a, another gallery in california 
And I made one particular painting this guy fell in love with, the gallery dealer. And he sold it. And he said, if you can make me a bunch of those, you know, we, we can do well. And I, and I said, Kim, you know me better than that. You know, I, I, I can't do that. I mean, I, I might bring you in something next week that's completely different. And that's just the way it's going to have to be. Mm -hmm. Good for you. That's a huge topic. Uh, yeah. Oh, and it's common. I and I have been there. I'm still there. Even I'm, I'm trying to get out of that mindset. I didn't even know um, that there was this idea of art is, is coming out of us that's processing our experiences and our memories and our passions. Um, for me, it was I, I only had one uh, example of what it was to be a, an artist and that was to be commercial to be selling and so that was the route I took I really didn't appreciate that there was more to it than that even though you know my art was still processing stuff I was just unaware and so now I'm <laughs> digging myself out of this hole that I've I've mm -hmm. dug and jumped into uh, which is wonderfully freeing not easy to do but I'm glad that you bring it up because it's a it's a really easy pit to fall into given yeah. um, this idea that selling is the, the ultimate pinnacle of being an artist, right? Selling to a stranger or being gallery represented. And yeah. there is so much more going on than that. Can, yeah. you, can you speak to why you paint? Who are you painting for? I will, but I want to back up just a slight bit because it's really critical that I cover this. And I will get to that. And that is this. I had the luxury, and it was a luxury, and the joy of teaching for a career. And, and that was my bread and butter, being able to teach. Mm. And I didn't have to survive on my work, you know. Okay. I didn't have to. Uh, whatever, whatever work sold over the years was kind of icing on the cake, to be quite honest. So that, was, that gave me the freedom to be able to make that choice. Not everyone can have that freedom. Uh, there are many, many artists who, and I teach to uh, illustration students who have to make work that sells to various clients. And that's a, and so what I say to them is try to be true to yourself. There's nothing wrong with doing something for money. Um, but to the degree that you can be true to yourself, most professional illustrators who have carved out a really successful path eventually got to a place where their work was like no other your work is like mm -hmm. no other. i've seen it if i see that i go oh that's julie's work i know that that's the signature style for lack of a better word but that takes let's be honest years to get there you see and and, and in the meantime i don't think there's anything wrong with commercial art making art that needs to sell or be in the galleries but it is a, it's a slippery slope it is a it is a really slippery slope and each artist has to decide for her, him or herself am i just completely selling out or am i enjoying what i'm doing like am i having a good time am i learning am i having a good time here is, is this my vision and i'm happy to do it that's really important or is this just another job and let me crank it out that's another story so um now i managed to forget your question i i, I went down a rabbit hole i'm sorry uh, <laughs> who do you paint for Ah, I paint for myself and no one else. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and that's the thing. Uh, that's a big question too. A lot of people ask the question, who is your audience? Mm. Well, you know, if you have a pie and you're working representationally in a figurative way that's fairly realistic, you're going to have a large audience at that pie. That's going to be a pretty big percentage of that pie. Sure. Um, but I'm working abstractly, which confuses a lot of people, yeah. rightly so, because that's, uh, and so I have a much smaller sliver of that pie as audience. And I know that. And that's, I can't help that. Um, so I, I paint for myself. I do. I, am I happy when people like my work and collect it and tell me they enjoy it, seeing it? Of course I do. Who wouldn't? You know, artists like attention. I'm not alone in that. But um, I, ha I have to, I have to be, uh, my own best critic. And when I'm convinced a piece is where it needs to be, then then I'm happy. And and that's this interesting topic too, because I think artists are very, um, what's the right word, vulnerable about the opinion of others, especially someone they respect or admire. They may think they're on the right track 
in their studio or with a given piece and someone that they respect and Mark comes, like, I don't know about that one. Uh, too much red or you know, whatever. And then they begin to question and doubt themselves. And, and that's very, I think that's very common. I think we have to look out for that. Yeah, I agree. I appreciate your answer. Um, a comment from Sue, uh, will you be talking about balancing commercialism versus being true to your style in your group? So in your mentorship group, is this one of the things that you tackle with artists? If it comes up, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to just, I mean, I'll have eight people and obviously each person has his or her own path that they're that they're on and and these the relative questions to that journey and they're going to they're going to be different one from the other and so if that question comes up i'm more than happy to to have that discussion and give my opinion and it's just one guy's opinion by the way just so we're clear. <laughs> That's why we have more than one mentor at Mastery. Is there's many ways to do this thing uh, called being an artist. And yeah, I really appreciate uh, your journey. Now I'm realizing we only have five minutes left and that went way faster than I expected. But uh, <laughs> just a reminder, everyone, that stick around to the end. We are going to give away Mastery's painting apron to an attendee. And then if you're new to Mastery's, uh, I'm going to talk oh, after we say goodbye to Mark. I'm going to chat a bit about Mastery's and how to get involved. It, it's a life-giving community. I'll show you how to work with Mark and I'll give away one month recording library membership to a non-member. So last plug there. So with just a few minutes left, Mark, oh, I feel like how do I make the most of four minutes? Um, I always like to ask our guests, what advice you would give to an emerging artist? Um, what's your what's your best piece of advice after five decades of practicing that you could sum up uh, to give to our aspiring and emerging artists? Sure. Um, let me start with the three Ps. I have three Ps that I like to talk about. One is practice. Practice, practice. One is patience. Be patient and perseverance. You've got to persevere no matter what. So work hard, have fun. I always say work hard, have fun. At the end of all my classes at college, as the students are leaving, I would say, because they're off to doing homework, I say work hard, have fun. Practice a lot. Be very patient, particularly in the face of things not going your way. Be Embrace failure and dare to fail. So failure is a, is, is a very critical part of the creative process. It's not something that just happens once in, once in a while. It is integral to our success. So understanding the nature of failure and not, and not just saying, oh, that's okay, I'll get better next time. No, what, what went wrong and why? So there's more to be said, but if I'm going to be very succinct here, which I like to do if I can, it's, it's that. Failure is an un unfortunate necessity to all things uh, that we tackle. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, it's something that we generally avoid, uh, and yet it's it's the only way to learn. It's the only way to progress. The only way to explore new things um, and to step out of our comfort zone. We have to embrace it. So that's yeah. Thank you for mentioning. That. Yeah, and then and just briefly, I will also discuss with my group the nature of frustration mm. and how we have doubt about ourselves. I'm very interested, Julie and others, in not just the nuts and bolts of what we do. I'm very interested in the human condition and the emotional um, uh, aspects of what we do. Um, and so that becomes ultimately part of my conversation with people because we all share those situations and feelings. We all share the fears and the frustrations and the doubt that occurs in the studio. And one of my goals is to help people understand that, to accept it and to figure out how to work through it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I love that we, that's what we share as artists. We are cut from the same cloth, even though we are so unique one from another, uh, but we do share those fears and insecurities and passions and sensitivities and insights, uh, all these great things that make 
artists, you know, wired to create and to express and to get people connecting. Uh, so good. Um, we're at the hour mark. That went way too fast. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for diving in, for sharing so generously. Um, and the PowerPoint, the visual presentation, really helpful as well. Uh, we wish you all the best in your new studio. I'm excited for you. What yeah. a joy. Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to And thank you. This has been fun. And you're right, it just flew by. So uh, I enjoyed myself. So thank you. And um, I hope that I get to meet more people. I, I'm looking forward to my eight folks in my group, but uh, above and beyond that, I'm looking forward to as well. Yeah, absolutely. And this recording will be available to our all of our members. It's a great way for them to meet you, to see what you're all about. Um, and uh, you have one mentorship group, but we'll probably bug you for another. No pressure. We'll see. But <laughs> folks, if you want to work with Mark, get on his wait list. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry I wasn't able to see the chat because I'm sure there was a lot of good stuff going on there. But I'm glad mm. that you were able to, to do that for me. And so I appreciate everyone who showed up, mm. the participants. And I appreciate you hanging in there and uh, for all your questions. So thank you all very much. Thanks, Mark, so much for coming. Appreciate you. All right. And all right, so you can stick around, Mark, if you like, or you can go. I'm going to give away that apron and dive into the into the chat. So okay. um, I'll stick around right. for a few minutes and then head out. Yeah, scroll through the chat. There's lots of great comments and, yeah, and that, thank yous. Do you want me to uh, X out my video and mute in the meantime, which I can do? No, whichever. Yeah, whatever you like. Okay, um, I'll, I'll certainly mute. My Okay. <laughs> All right, folks. So let's give away that apron. The master's painting apron is awesome. It says I'm a master's artist. It has three pockets. It's white. Mine is completely trashed. I would show it, but it's embarrassing. Um, so Mike, you are going to draw a name of one of our attendees here and I'm just looking for it. Okay. The winner of the painting apron is Marie Betcher. Marie, if you're still here, could you say hello in the chat? Uh, and if you're not, we'll draw another name. Marie Bo Betcher. Oh, I see you just made a comment. Um, if you're still here, Marie, say hello. I think she is. What a great interview. Lots of amazing, exciting thoughts. Thank you. Okay, if Marie, say hello in the chat. If not, we'll draw another name for that apron. Oh, there she is. Okay, Marie, congrats. You'll get the painting apron. And the rest of you, if you are not a member, stick around. We're going to give away a one-month recording library membership, and that is our library of these event recordings. So we do an event like this every week. Uh, interviews like what we had today, we have two-hour demos, one-hour panel discussions on really important topics like how to price your artwork, imposter syndrome, marketing. Uh, we do live critiques on everything under the sun. And all of those recordings over three years are in that library. So we'll give away one month uh, membership to that library. It's a great way to pick a mentor, by the way, if you want to work with a mentor to watch the recordings, then you can kind of meet everyone and uh, choose someone who you feel is a good fit. All right, so um, Michael message you, Marie, on how to get that apron. Okay, so I'm going to dive in a, uh, to talk a little bit about Masterius and what we are all about. Uh, we, we began three years ago. Um, one of the great things that came out of COVID, I know it was a tough time, but Masterius was born out of it, and uh, it's been an incredible adventure. Masterius is all about relationships and it's all about getting artists back into community with each other, not just because of COVID and that isolation, but because artists have always been isolated. Traditionally, that's how we're more so wired and because it's a solo um, endeavor. And so um, what we started with was mentorship groups where a master artist like Mark would work with up to eight artists who are at the same stage. We do everything in small groups and that is because um, you will know the value of, of a master if you've taken a workshop or a course, you understand the value of that, ex that expertise. What a lot of us have been missing is the value of the peer-to-peer -peer relationship. 
Um, what you will find and what we hear from our members and what I've experienced too uh, is that you would, you'd come for the mentor and then you stay for the community. The community is just pivotal. The peer, the peers in your group uh, become life-giving friends. You learn actually a lot from other artists who are on the journey alongside of you. And also you learn a lot because the mentor is um, speaking into your work and your life and also into the work and life of the other artists in your group. And so you're learning from that as well. Anyway, so mentorship is our main thing. Um, the groups happen monthly, not weekly, not daily. It's just once a month. We designed it to fit into your busy lives and schedules. It is a two hour session. You would be with up to eight artists who are at the same stage and that would be aspiring or emerging. There's definitions of that on the website so you can figure out where you're at. And then the beauty of the mentorship groups if you've been to a workshop, you will know the experience of two, three days of intense learning, huge download of information with some practice, a touch of feedback, and then you're sent back to your studio to assimilate all that you've learned and to figure it out on your own, how to apply that learning to your own work, to your own style and uh, that there's no follow up. There's no one really to ask questions after the workshop. So what we're doing and what we've added uh, to call this mentorship, there's teaching, absolutely, but there's feedback and there's time for practice and there's time for questions. So to really simplify the model, we're taking the, the workshop model and breaking it up into small pieces and spreading it out uh, month over month. So yes, you will learn something in your session and then you have the whole month to put it into practice. And the first thing you get when you come back to your group is feedback on the work you did. So your mentor is going to be able to give you feedback and then new teaching on the next thing that you have decided as a group uh, to learn about. And then you have the whole month to put that into practice. And the first thing you get is feedback. So it's just broken down into smaller um, chunks and with a huge injection of practice and feedback. And so what we hear is, and what I've experienced is that the learning really sticks. You really get to incorporate what you've learned and apply it to your own unique work. We're not trying to put out more Mark Eanes or more David Langevin's or more Julie DeBoer's. We want to help artists find their own way, their own unique work and their own unique expression. Um, we also have courses. We also do art shows together. We also have these weekly live events. So we're learning a ton, experiencing um, great things together. And um, yeah, and so that's kind of the synopsis of what we're up to. One thing I should mention is that in every mentorship group, there is an, an artist called the Navigator. The Navigator is an artist just like you there to be mentored, but they're also an assistant to the mentor and they are a community developer for the small group. So you're going to actually be meeting uh, with your group and Navigator mid-month for a one-hour casual session online at Zoom like this face-to-face -face interactive um, and that is so that you can connect as a group you can talk about the homework you can ask questions you can just check in with each other and the the point of that is to that the navigator is there to help ensure that you are getting the experience you're hoping for and that your meet, needs are getting met in that mentorship group uh, but also gives you a chance to connect as artists and I am probably the most sensitive introverted person on the planet. I had no idea how much I needed community until I had community and now it just blows me away every every day uh, how valuable those relationships are uh, and how life-changing it really is to find your people, to find your tribe. Anyways, I digress. I'm going to just show you a couple of things on the website so you can see how to find a mentor that uh, that fits your needs. And then we'll give away that one month recording library membership. And I have a dog walking around my feet. <laughs> if you see me distracted, I'm scared he's going to, she's going to jump. Um, okay, here is the website. And we'll have to ensure
Sorry about that. Mike just told me that my audio did not transfer. Let me try that again. Okay. Here we go. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, when you go to the website, masteries.com, start here on the How It Works page. It will answer all of your questions and fill you in on all the details on how mentorship works. When you're ready, go to Choose Your Mentor. I'm going to click on that. And this will bring you to our big, beautiful grid where all of our mentors are represented. And we have grown. Uh, we're in 30 countries now, and we have masters all over the world, so there's lots to choose from. The way that you're going to narrow it down and find the right mentor for you is either if you know, say, Mark, uh, you want to see Mark, search him up, and you will find Mark Ains right there. If you're not sure who to work with, you're going to use this purple filter. So just click on it. It will open up all these different ways that you can filter and hone in on the right mentors so you can choose whether you want to work with a master artist versus a professional level artist and there's a bit of a price difference there that's in us dollars what stage you're at and there's definitions of these on the how it works page and then you can choose one or more mediums and you can continue selecting. If you are looking for something very specific, you can pull it out here. Our mentors also can have specialties. So if you want to, you're really passionate about color, then uh, you can choose color. And then if you have limited time, day of the week, style, subject matter, et cetera. Anyways, you can see now with what I selected, it's brought it down from about 180 mentors to three. And look who's here is Mark. And I wanted to show you his page. So you're going to see an image of the mentor's work, their name and their um, medium. And then you just click through. So every mentor has a page all about them. And we do this so that you can learn about them and um, get to know them before you meet. So you'll see Mark's uh, mediums, his specialties are composition, color, and artistic process and mindset. A little bit about him, his website, Instagram, check him out, follow him. Images of his work. And then Mark's expertise. Every mentor chooses their expertise and there's three categories. There's technical, marketing, and business. They choose not just what they're excellent at and what they're expert in, but what they're passionate about. We want our mentors really working in their areas of passion. This is where you're going to find a good match for you. So if these are areas that are high on your list of, of uh, areas you want to develop your skills in, then Mark would be a great uh, choice for you. Um, and then you go a little bit farther and you'll see their group information. So Mark's group meets on the second Saturday of every month. The next session is on September 9th and the timing is 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Mountain Time. And then we list it in Eastern Time and in two other, this is Australian um, time zone. So if you don't know your time zone, you can contact us. But anyways, make sure that you do know your time zone or we can help you figure that out. And I know Mark's group is already full, but don't despair. Add your email to the wait list right here. And if a spot opens up or if Mark opens another group, which we'll try to twist his arm about, you will get an email right away. And then you'll have to rush back to get your spot because we don't hold them. So you'll get an email with everyone else on the wait list anyway. So join that wait list there. And then there's a little bit more about Mark at the bottom. And then before I give away that recording library, we do have courses as well. These are also live and interactive. Everything we do is live and interactive. We're all about um, the face-to-face -face conversation. And there's a filter up here as well for the courses so that you can see what we've got. And they're all designed by the mentors. Uh, so they might be three days in a row. They might be once a week. They might be um, every other week. So they're all different. So you can check that out. 
Um, Masters members always get a discount. If you are not a member, you can become one for free. I mentioned this before with the free trial of the events membership. So go grab that. It will get you into our weekly events for the next month for free. Um, you can sign up right there and you use the code try events in the cart and then you'll get an email and you'll be added to Mastery's chat, which is our chat community. And that is where you will find the event tickets. So this is another cool thing at Masterius. We have an online community, and this is where you get to meet and connect with your group throughout the month. Every mentor has a private channel, and that's where you can chat, share images uh, throughout the month. You also get your event tickets here. You can watch the event recordings here. Lots going on in Masterius chat. And, oops, let's see if I can get back. Mm, here we go. Uh, and then of course we do art shows together as well. And these weekly events. So what's coming up is right here. You can see if you grab that uh, events membership, our weekly events coming up are right here so next week is a studio tour with Ardith Goodwin and Olaf Schneider and then a panel discussion on uh, aspiring to emerging are you really ready to sell your art then we have a two-hour demo with Samantha Williams Chapelsky it's a golden ac uh, acrylics demo and then smart art income strategies with these two masters every week is another one two-hour demo with David Langevin phenomenal artist uh, Canadian master Anyways, we're learning lots, we're having a lot of fun together, and we would love for you to join us. Let's draw the name of our winner of the Recording Library membership. Thanks for sticking around, folks. And the winner is Stephanie Brown. Stephanie, are you still here? Say hello in the chat. Uh, if not, we'll draw another name. Oh, there she is. Stephanie, congrats. Mike will um, give you some info to get you that recording library membership. If you didn't win, go grab one of those events memberships for free. Get the free trial. Check it out. See what it's like. You'll be added to Mastery's chat where you can start meeting other artists and mentors, get to know the community. And if ever you are on the website, you have a question, there's a little chat bubble in the corner. That goes directly to our team, so don't hesitate to ask us questions if you're on the website um, or email us at masterius at masterius.com. We are happy to help you pick a mentor. If you're not sure what stage you're at after you've been through the How It Works page, we help lots of artists figure that out too. So we're here to walk with you through the experience, and we hope that you'll join us uh, in a mentorship group or come next week to our next event. Thank you so much for coming. I hope that you found it valuable. Mark is amazing, and I'm so glad he's on our team. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Have a wonderful evening or morning, wherever you are in the world. Take care.